Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. Now, something has struck me as a little bit of a sidebar to today, which what? is that obviously uh, in my extensive research for, about our subject, it took me down a rabbit hole on folk music. Ah. It suddenly occurred to me that if you listen to a lot of folk music, if English folk music was your historical reference, you would think that ye olde England basically consisted of towns that were just full of blokes who'd come from another town who were looking for a girl who a mate of theirs back home used to know well and just checking up on her, making wow. sure that her hair flowed still down her hair, you know, and then, then going home. That's the entire genre, is it? That's it, isn't it? It's always, you know, if you go, please seek a fair maiden. I knew her well. And she's like, well, I would, mate. I'd look her up, but I've got to sell these turnips first. You know? But all, and all of this with one finger in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> I was really into folk music, actually. I have to say, I went through a folk music moment. It was, it was a, it was a bit Hancock, I think, you know. <laughs> 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 but I, I did, I did like it, and, and uh, I, you know, I used to try and sort. of you know we've had this discussion before play make up music to old ballads that i because i had a book of old ballads but i didn't know what the music was uh, and of course our our guest today um was in magna carta that's right i i thought he was in pentangle for a bit but then you said you thought he was in penthouse and um <laughs> and we were both right <laughs> <laughs> but magna carta and of course he's been in with the elton john band since 1970, blah. And 1972, I think it was... It was um, uh, Madman. Madman Across the Water was when he became a permanent member of the band. And he's been there pretty much... He sort of dipped in and out. He's kind of... I guess you see him in the way that you'd look at Mike Garson with Bowie, wouldn't you? Y yeah, but even more so, because Bowie more would so, just... But that, but you know. in the, an absolute fixture. It wasn't always there. But to be honest, it wasn't... The big bits, he was always there. Yeah, and, and that band was such a fixture, you know, with, with Nigel Ols Olsen and Dean Murray and Dean Ray Murray, Cooper. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I grew up absolutely loving those records. And, I, you know, I really, I'd really like to focus on that 70s period, to be honest. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, because the dive on this, it's a reminder, I mean, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road was one of my absolute favourite albums. Yeah. Don't then. Shoot Me before then, you know, which was Elton's kind yeah. of glam rock album. Uh, I mean, there's so, um, so much. Honky Chateau. I mean, it, it just, it, it really is an incredible part, a piece of music to be part of. And, and I, I played on stage with him. I don't know he's going to remember this. I played a few times on stage with him doing Saturday Nights All Right um, in Dublin and in London at Wembley. Um, but you know what? We parted as well. So he may have forgotten that I was there. Oh, there That's you That's my go. excuse. Oh, well. We... Well, I've all I have I haven't crossed paths with them, but there's there's a few near misses, but I'm sure they'll come up. Yeah, they will. Um, I'm really excited about having one of the great guitar players, uh, British guitar players, on of all time, uh, and it's Davy John Stone. He's changed. That's right. He's changed the pronunciation since moving to America. As for yeah, well, he's Scottish, isn't he? Yeah, but he was Johnston in Scotland, and and apparently, really a long time ago, he decided he'd be John Stone. Anyway, we'll probably ask him that, won't we? John Stone sounds like something out of Game of Thrones, doesn't it? <laughs> Davy John Stone. Let's get him on. Yeah, welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I've been sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. That caused a big problem in the band, actually. I was having too much fun. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it, and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. Well, I get the feeling that us three should go for a pint. That's what I think. I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. It's, it's get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! Ah, Davey! Can you hear me okay? We can yeah. hear you great. We can hear you just great. Can you hear us? Awesome. Brilliant. So that's your son, Charlie, because, so, of course, I worked and adore your son, Tam. He sent me a message last night because he knew that it was coming up, that I was going to be seeing you guys, and he sent lots of wishes and love to you. Uh, uh, he's still... So nice. He's amazing. I mean, what a musician and writer and... 
and he's been doing videos for me as well recently. That's, yeah, I know he does not that stuff. I've got to say because Tam, um, I used Tam on the music for a TV series, Gary, back in the nineties. Right. They called the Young Persons Going For. I got Tam on an Ivan Novello nominated song, but he had this fantastic party trick he used to do, which is where he would play drums, and he'd play a whole part with one hand, but with his other hand. He would ghost it, so he would do. He would be playing drums with the John Lennon slapback echo. Wow! So, oh. grew, gra, grew, 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 gra. It was amazing. Is that what well, it's not... like in your house, David? Is uh, do, uh, people, have you people grown up, your kids and you, just sort of playing music around the house? It's become that exactly that. It's so bizarre. But I mean, you know, I don't have any lawyers or dentists in my kids. They're all. <laughs> fucking musicians <laughs> artists you know i mean it's great i love it to death and and uh, i'm very grateful that you know i've got kids who are doing something they want to do and you know i'm able to give them that opportunity and help them with it occasionally and other times just stand the hell back out of the way let them get on with it but what you were saying about time is interesting guy because when he was maybe six or seven years old and he started really getting into music He'd be sitting there with his um, little cassette player with a Beatles, you know, whatever album, Best of the Beatles. And I could hear him making drum sounds with his nose. He'd make like, you know, <laughs> snare, like Ringo snare sound. Beat, beat and he'd make it with, yeah, with his Ringo nose. beatbox. <laughs> yeah. And I'd, <laughs> I'd hear him in the back of the car and all I'd hear was this. <laughs> and and he's just, he, he, so he's able to simulate those sounds right. in an analog way, you know what I mean? Like you say, instead yeah, of yeah, yeah, actually yeah, having yeah. the effect there. Yeah. Didn't you make music in lockdown with them? Not so much with time. We did a lot of remote stuff because he's in uh, Cornwall. He's lived in Cornwall uh, for most of his life. And um, he last time he was here was probably probably six or seven years ago, the last time he came for a, for a good visit. But because of COVID and everything else, he, he's been isolating and... Um, Ironically, that's when I started doing most of my writing, when we were off the road, knowing that we weren't going to tour anymore for a while. Uh, so that's when me and the kids started mucking around and doing stuff together right here in the house. It's been great. Oh, but Well, I just to say to carry on the family thing, I um, went all the way to Manchester to take my son to see you with Elton at Manchester because I thought that was it because he was at uni there and that, that's such a box tick. I said, you, you know, he writes songs, so you've got to see Elton. Oh. It was just magnificent. What a gig. Pretty good show, isn't it? That, that show oh. was... I took all my kids to see it at the O2 as well. You know, yeah. I oh. mean, this is... Because, because Elton's been in my life since... For as long as I can remember. Or, you know, since I very first got into to pop and rock music. And, and that really means you as well, Davey. And, Absolutely. Oh, you know, and, you. And, and while this was still happening, you know, it was absolutely important that my kids... I passed the baton on to our kids and said, look, this is who, partly who I am and what inspired me. Man. But also, I think there's a thing, sorry, David, but th because Elton has always been so much about passing the baton. You know, he was the guy who said, George Michael, look at this guy, and he still does that with that brilliantly genuine love of new music and new musicians. You know? yeah. That must be a really energising thing to be around. No, absolutely, because he's always championed new stuff and in the case of of george as you mentioned i mean he was so i mean i remember when he played me the first wham album and um he was so excited about it and and i was immediately blown away because you know you hear names and i've lived in the states for quite a long time since like 83 full time over here so i missed quite a lot of what was going on but he would play me you guys stuff he'd play me spandau and he said, this is kind of what I want the new band to sound like, you know? <laughs> so all the time that, this is what I love about music and guys like us who are so into what everybody's doing in, in the business or in the scene in general, mm. is that people do pass it around. You know, you want to share what somebody else is doing. And, what was um, it like when you started to get to the end of this final show? Was, it, was, it, was there a sense of, of, of countdown and loss and... Not I mean, loss, not not loss. It's, it's like going been... off to it's like going off to dignitas, isn't it? It's like <laughs> you know we've committed to this date ending. Bit, you know, <laughs> bit <laughs> harsh, <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> cruel but fair. 
yeah. you know, it, it actually, for me, um, I, I kept looking at the audience and I'd see fans all over the place crying their eyes out towards those last, you know, Mm-mm. so many, I don't know, the last couple of years, actually, it was like that. Um, but I never really felt that. There was one point and I was telling my friend, I, I was having dinner with James Newton Howard, who's who played in the band back in 75, 76. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. And he's done all the wonderful music scores for movies, yeah. you know. And uh, we were talking about some of that stuff back then. And um, he was asking me that question. And, and I told them that I really felt it during the very last gig when we were playing Someone Saved My Life Tonight, which is a big moment for the fans and for everybody and for Elton in general. And um, when I heard Nigel's, because I mean, our sound is great on stage as well as out front, hopefully. And um, hearing Nigel's kit, and the fact that there's Nigel, myself, Elton and Ray all up there, we're only missing D, God bless him, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And somehow that sound just spoke to me and I thought, fuck, we really did something special. Because yeah. while you're doing it, you don't really think uh, that it's that, you just do what you're doing, right? You know, you don't really think, oh, this is going to be amazing. It's just what you do. And, and uh, that's what our whole thing is like. And it's only been in the last five to 10 years that I've realized how much people have appreciated that music. And as Gary was saying, pass it on, as you were saying, pass it on to your kids because it's solid music that will, I think, stand the test of time. That's a cool yeah. thing. What I, what I loved is your subtleties and your commitment to to the original material with this constant changing of guitars that you do and as a guitarist you know i was nerding out over you know the double necks <laughs> and and and, the, and all the different you know strats the gibsons and the painted gibson oh my god that painted gibson with with, yeah. with, the, El, with the elton's yellow brick road yeah, your stuff tech must be on his toes and, and, well, and, and it was just your amazing tech must be on his toes yeah. He's, he certainly is. And uh, yeah, it, it's incredible, actually, because my, my tech of since 1986, uh, Rick Salazar, who's brilliant, unfortunately, he couldn't make this last four month tour oh. due to illness. So a week before I just found out he's very ill and, you know, he's in treatment right now. He's doing good. But yeah, he and I had such a special, you know, ridiculous uh, thing going that um only you guys being musicians know what I'm talking about, really. It's really special. And yeah, all the painted stuff. I mean, um, Rick's girlfriend, now wife, Tracy Loving, painted that one that you're talking about, the Les Paul that I used on this last tour. And on previous tours, on this whole farewell episode, uh, Bernie Toppin gave me a couple of pieces of artwork that we put onto guitars. Wow. And they've since been sold off. Um so you know what it's like nowadays, people are going nuts for guitars that have been used in kind of iconic situations. So, I, um, you know, during guy's, my retirement. Guy's got a special guitar with who's painted by, go on, Guy. Well, Your oh, bass. Actually, I've got it, it's just over here. It's, oh, worth, wow. having, it's, it's worth having a look at because it's, it's quite, a famous, quite a famous artist. This is a bass that, uh, I did some music for a film for Damien Hurst. Oh, man. He, he spin painted this for me. Oh. <laughs> Amazing. Oh. We'll put a picture Amazing. of that. It up sounds on the terrible because it's got like an inch and a half of surfboard paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> but how well, many you know, guitars? It, yeah, it's funny because the, so, the strat that I played on tour, the painted one you're talking about, that was my daughter, Juliet, who, who uh, she painted that for my 17th birthday. And um, I mean, she bought the guitar for me and painted this amazing, I mean, she's just an incredible young artist and designer, that's what she does. And uh, so I've been really privileged to use that on stage and I, I see people's reaction when I come out with it, as I'm sure you get from that. You know, people see it and they go, holy shit, what's that, you know? And I love that. People, other guitar players, you know, who, who go like, oh my God, what's that? And But even regular people who don't play instruments, they see some of these guitars and they go, and it's an interest to them. So I've always liked that vibe where people are seeing that I'm actually, I'm not being flash about it, I'm actually bringing instruments in for a specific reason. 
and um, yeah. people but, but see, people seem to like it. It's a glamour object to begin with, isn't it? You yeah, know, the, for sure. You know, a, a guitar. Sound. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, yeah. The greatest weapon ever given to the working classes. Uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but how many do you have? Because I mean, there's a big change going on. And it, what is going on in that collection? How big I is it? I hate to say it. I hate to say it. I, I don't know. I really don't know. I haven't a clue. Um, uh, you're quite right, Davey. Frankly, I think it's vulgar to know how many guitars <laughs> you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I've, I've actually, just before we got on this call, uh, I just got an email from uh, one of our equipment managers who's telling me that all the gear will be back within the week. So I've got three separate rigs full of gear that are coming back to LA that I'm going to have to find storage for because in the past, we've always had a, a specific storage center at the airport, near the airport, um, because we've been touring so much forever. You know, we've always toured a lot. But now I'm going to have Is it to... one of those bonded things so it never actually comes into the country? That's right. That's right, yeah. exactly. But now I've got to get all that stuff out and plus all the shit that's been piling up for God knows how many years. Uh, so I've got a busy week And finally up. pay the duty on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not paying it. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> Bollocks to that. I will not be paying that. What's your favourite? What's your favourite guitar? <laughs> favourite guitar? Blimey, I, I, you know what? I love them all. I love them all, Gary. I've got so many great guitars. The great thing is about being back home right now, because I've got a, a bunch of guitars that I always keep back here. Um, and um, it's great reacquainting myself with those instruments that I haven't given much time. You know, I mean, just amazing instruments lying about. And I realized, my God, I haven't changed the strings on this one for six months or something. So I love getting back acquainted and also things like my sitar i've got a sitar in the house that's um coming up for 60 years old you know i got it well, probably 55 years old it's the one that i've used on a bunch of elton records and stuff yeah. lucy in the sky and stuff like that and old mandolins uh so i love it all that's the thing david because some of your credits on albums and not even just with elton but with other people it's like you have a list of instrument credits. You're like a sort of David Lindley character <laughs> where you'd turn up and do everything, you know. I love it. I really enjoy it. And I think that's why like, I think that's why I have been used by other players and asked to play on certain things because they know I can, I, I can do that. I can deliver stuff. And um, I've always had fun, for example, with James, as we were talking about before. I've done a few scores with James Newton Howard and mm -hmm. I had a wonderful experience with uh, Hans Zimmer Another good mate of mine who I'm sure you guys oh, yeah, I know, know from yeah. back there, from, from the buggles yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that, from the bugles, as I call them. Um, well, he used to have that fantastic studio in Lily Yard, which was just like one giant uh, moog. It was amazing. Exactly. And Hans mm. asked me to do um, the Sherlock Holmes uh, thing with him. And a lot of it is centered around banjo, because uh, I played tenor banjo as well. And that, that was great fun. I love doing things that are a bit different. It's always kept, it's kept me fresh. You know, it's kept my play. I was wondering what the first record was that I heard you on. And, and I thought, so the first album I bought was Honky Chateau. And so it was probably banjo. You were probably playing banjo on that Honky Cat, weren't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Honky Cat, I mean, Honky Chateau was the, the first official album that I was on. I played, I was a session man. <laughs> like nine, oh, Mad 19 Man. year olds Mad on Madman. Yeah, I did yeah. The, the title track and right. Holiday Inn, which has got mandolin and sitar and all these things on it. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was kind of like my, that was the point when Elton obviously said, I want to get this guy in the band because up to then it was just the trio. It was him and, and Dee Murray and Nigel Olsen. So um, he asked me to join and that's when we all went to, to the Chateau in 1972 in January and did Honky Chateau and it had all these tracks like Rocket Man and Honky Chateau. So that was the first major album where we started having that run of hits that was insane, you know. Can I say something about that album? And it's been just a delight going back and listening to them, just to reacquaint oh, cool. myself. But Honky Chateau has a thing I hadn't really clocked at the time, which is how, rather than just Elton Sound, how immersed in what was happening at that time it is. It's got that real kind of little feet, Sneaking Sally through the alley, period. Yeah. Robert Palmer. Americana. There's a lot of that swampy funk in it, mm. which was, was kind of in the air. And, and it's the bluesiest kind of, in, in terms of kind of bending notes and stuff. Elton's leaning in a way 
you don't really think of him. Right. Uh, I, I, yeah. he, wanted, he wanted to do something entirely different from all the wonderful uh, orchestral stuff they'd done for the previous albums with, you know, the unbelievably talented and sorely missed Paul Buckmaster. You know, oh. it's incredible when I think about it, guys. When I think about Paul and I think about Gus Dudgeon, who's gone, yeah. mm -hmm. I think about Dean Murray. But back then, doing yeah, those... I've got to say, major, major influence on me when oh. I first got a bass guitar. Incredible, Fantastic. right? Economical, Incredible. great. Absolutely. And, and the great thing was, those albums, it was only Elton, myself, Dee and Nigel, and then occasionally we'd use Ray, Ray Cooper, who became an official member in uh, the beginning of 74 or something, like, end of 73. Um, so it was only the four or five of us. It wasn't a whole squad of, of, of massive things as the previous albums had been. Um, and that's what Elton had been shooting for and it really paid off. I think also the fact that I was a multi-instrumentalist, I think that was an added factor because yeah, yeah, yeah. we didn't need to hire other people. If we wanted to bring other people in, it was maybe like a horn section or a couple of numbers or, or maybe like we used on Honky Chateau, we used Jean-Luc Ponty played uh, some violin on a couple of tracks and that kind of thing. So it was all just a, a very, very tight nucleus. Um, that was a, a very fun part of the whole thing. And also... It's a very simple album in there, in many ways, yeah. isn't it? It's, a, it's an Americana style, you know, yeah. it has, you know, folk music feel to it. I mean, we'll get onto your folk background in a minute. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, Susie Dramas was my favorite as a kid. I right. mean, Elton singing on this. I mean, it's oh, wow. mellifluous, isn't it? I mean, phenomenal. The talent. Yeah. And I just want to mention how, you know, of late, I've listened to that live album that he did, the radio show, with it was just the trio before you arrived, Davey. And he's oh, 23. Oh, what a great it's album. Um, Which you, I've, I've, I've got to say that Gary has actually mentioned that quite a few times. It's one of the kids. So it's he's not lying. Such a great album. And you realize a 23 year old kid is just so full of talent. If anyone out there in music deserved to be a superstar for the rest of his life, you just hear it there and then. Um, well, I, when I heard it, I was completely blown away because I heard it before before I was asked to join, but I heard it by accident because I was helping. I'd been asked to do Bernie Taupin's uh, poetry album. He wanted to make a record of just of spoken word stuff. And, and um, myself and Caleb Quay and Sean Phillips and a few other musicians... Um, made this really cool little, we were just doing stream of consciousness, if you like. We were doing like music while Bernie was speaking. Right. And in the off, while we were between tracks, Gus said, oh, listen to this. We just did this with the guys in, in New York. We heard the album and I was completely gobsmacked. I mean, the bass sound of that record, apart from everything else, was phenomenal. And again, that shows not only how great Elton and the band was, but how great Gus was and the way they recorded that record. The sound is great on that record. Uh, I really uh, inspirational, the whole thing. Yeah, one of my favorites too. Let's stay on Hockey Chateau for just a minute because Rocket Man, right? I just wanted to, I mean, oh. what is interesting and I wondered if there is a connection. Here's Gus Dudgeon and he, we know he, he, he produced Space Oddity, right? Absolutely. So, so there is, it feels like that there's a link here. If I look at the lyrics of, of Rocket Man, I'm wondering if Bernie saw this as an up-tempo record. Did he see it as this spaced out, beautiful production arrangement? Anyway, there are a couple of things to throw in at you there. No, it's a, it's a very good point, but um, very often when, when Elton gets Bernie's lyrics, for example, if he's not there and he just receives a stack of lyrics, you know, Bernie has never any clue what it's going to be like. He's always so excited to come and hear a playback when we've got most of the tracks done. That's always been the case. But Rocket Man was seriously special because he wrote it so quickly. I mean, he wrote it in about 20 minutes, the song. And when I heard it, the first thing that I thought was that beautiful openness, the way it goes into the chorus. But it was in B flat, typical piano player, right? It's in B flat. Oh, and I'm going, oh always, great. Always Thanks good. a lot. Yeah. But that made me go to my kind of folk side or that whole vibe I've got about open tunings. I've always been a freak about open guitar tunings. So I decided to tune my guitar to B flat. Right. So all those acoustic guitars, there's about four, 
for acoustic sauna, I think, all playing right. that chorus section, and it's got this sparkle sound. Mm. You know, uh, in fact, that was probably another mate of mine, and I, I hate to drop names. Actually, I love it. Lenny Kravitz. It's, it's kind of what you're here for. This week. <laughs> there you go. Well, Len, Lenny's a dear friend of mine, and I just saw him recently in Paris uh, at one of our gigs. Lenny, and Lenny. Lenny, Lenny Kravitz always said oh, Henry. to me, <laughs> Lenny said to me, you know, uh, he said, Oh, I love what you've done, you know, with all this music. But Rocket Man, those acoustic guitars, is the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. So I showed him how I did it, you know. Right. And um, it, it's a, and then the other thing was the idea of doing, you know, some slide stuff, really spaced out. The takeoff. And you suggest something like that to Gus, and he's on it in a, in a heartbeat. <clears throat> so those ideas, they're very sparse, and they're kind of literal. You know, when he sings Rocket Man, there's a... And also you've got the background vocals, which was again, was um, kind of one-stop shopping as we found out with, because we realized that between the three of us, uh, Dee, Nigel and myself had this sound that was to carry on on all the, all the albums. And Rocket Man was the first example mm. of that. So yeah, it was a really special track all the way around. And plus being the first number one, that was like, wow, yeah. what's this? The thing about you, Dave, is, and, and it should be pointed out well, listen, if anyone doesn't know, David has this fantastic Instagram feed where oh, he shows brilliant. you, where he shows you what he does. It's so, it's brilliant. so brilliant. It's, and it's so just entertaining. Oh, um, thanks. But you're, because you're, I mean, what's great about it is you're such a parts man, aren't you? It's like, it's not like, okay, the guitars are playing these chords. It's like this part, and it so often it fits between Elton's piano. Exactly. I mean, who would want, I mean, I've heard it and you've all seen it. But, you know, a, a guitar player blowing all over, blowing solos all over some guy's stuff, you know. It, it might be brilliant what he's playing, but it, mm -mm. It, the song is destroyed. No, I've always been the kind of person who, uh, I'll, I'll put the, the song first. And what I do is to embellish the song and embellish the, the, the piano and whatever may be considered to be the lead instrument. Because really, I was joining a, a piano-based band. And it was only over the course of the first few albums that that became uh, with things like, you know, Love Lies Bleeding and, and Saturday Night and Bitches Back, where it became uh, as much a guitar driven band when it needed to be. And that, I think that's the key. Only when it needed to be that, that's when it was that. You know what I mean? The rest of the time, I was having great fun because that's my nature is to try and uh, make the song better, make the whole thing better. Uh, my part as far as I'm concerned, isn't that important? You know what I mean? I, I'm doing what comes first uh, mm. to me. It's my first idea, usually is the best one. And um, that's why I enjoy it so much. It's kind of how you came in though, isn't it? Because you're a 20 year old kid and, and you can talk us through this, but how you, you get invited down to, they tried a couple of other guitarists and you get down and you come up with the part for Mad Men Across the Water that El right. Elton thinks is, it just fits in with his piano. Right. Well, how did you end up there? Well, it was bizarre. I found out quite recently. So I knew that they'd tried the part with uh, Mick Ronson. God bless him. Another one I sorely miss. Okay. Mick was a lovely man. Uh, and Michael Chapman. They tried it with two great guitar players. And it just wow. it just wasn't the right thing. Because oh, Ronson played I, on Chapman's record, didn't he? Uh, yeah. One of his early And here's there. the other thing that I didn't find out till recently that it was Mike Chapman who I knew very well from the folk days, we became good mm. friends, you know, who had suggested me. He told Gus, uh, you should get Davey for this. And I didn't know that till quite recently that he was the guy who said- was that at my, Did you find out at Mike's funeral? Because was that a gathering you went to? I know, no, I did. I found out, um, I can't remember who told me actually, but I was so saddened to hear about that as well, because he's another one. How, how brilliant, I mean, him, John Martin, Mm -hmm. guys that I was close with and who were just phenomenal players who, you know, you, you always think, my God, I wish more people had heard that. But you know, it's what it is, right? You never know. I'm, I'm, I still champion people like him and my particular favorite is the Incredible String Band. When I was oh, a kid, yeah. you know, when I was like 15 <laughs> and discovered them, I, th I thought that was it. And, you know, to me, Sergeant Pepper and the Incredible String Band uh, albums at that period, that was the shit to me. That was what was going on. But that's know? that whole Joy, Joe Boyd kind of uh, yeah, world, isn't yeah. it? With uh, yeah. Down at Middle Earth and, well, UFO Club, really. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
And it's amazing how many folk musicians came from that period and went into bands, you know, top rock bands like Rick Wakeman, you know, uh, he was in the Strobs and the Strobs. That's right. Yeah. Rick and I used to hang around, and and uh, he actually he actually played piano at my first wedding, uh, which was hilarious. We were very out of it, and um, <laughs> you know there was just that vibe. Dave Swarbrick, you know, yeah, was working with Martin uh, Carthy, and all of a sudden he's the main guy in Fairport Convention. There was a lot of that Henry McCulloch, you know. Um, uh, there was a lot wings. of wings. Yeah. It was just amazing. There was a that whole circle of people who suddenly were in other bands because maybe because they had different ideas and it was going to no. I maybe... think folk was being embraced, wasn't it? You're right, absolutely. You know, the folk was being embraced, and then people thought maybe this has got more of a ceiling on it than being in a rock and roll band. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they made they made the jump when they could. Yeah, exactly. you may well be right. Yeah, I love so, that. So, David, you, so David, you go down to what studio? Trident. I'm I'm thinking probably Trident yeah. or somewhere like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Trident Mad Men. was Trident was our the favorite. That was the that was where we did Mad Men. But I was also kind of a regular at Trident before that because I did stuff with Ralph McTell, who's another dear friend of mine. Wow. And we did a, a, an album or two together. It was great fun. Um, I did Magna Carta, who I ended up, ended up joining for for a year. Uh, which great was record, great. Loved that. Great record, well. well, and I must say, fantastically recorded record. Yeah. Beautiful arrangements, and that the I mean the acoustic because back then acoustic guitars were were hit and miss. Let's face yeah. it, yeah. on albums. Good again, that, and th Those are exquisite, especially with the left right mm. balance. Well, you know that's Gus Dudgeon again. Oh, there you go. What a producer. You know, Gus, Gus yeah. was such, I mean, he paved the way for so many great things. He got it about acoustic guitars because, you know, I'm sure you guys feel the same way about the Beatles because for me, that's been it since I first heard them when I was like 11 or something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you start learning the riffs and you do all that and you're George Harrison mad. Well, I always leave a bit of George in the studio when I'm recording mm. something because to me, he's still the guy I mean, mm. we, were, we were chatting about parts earlier and, you know, I think that's where I got my thing about that, about doing something that's going to be killer that people will, other guitar players will notice, but will fit right in with the song. So the way he did acoustics with, with John, I mean, another one, John yeah. Lennon, God bless. Mm -hmm. We got to work with John, which was someone else. But I mean, the way they use acoustics, the way that George uses um, ar arpeggioed guitar parts in the back and double track them and double track piano we were doing shit back mm -hmm. then and having a blast because it sounded like the Beatles to us you know yeah, 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 on yeah. those first uh, albums um, it was so much fun because obviously we had also we had Ken Scott engineering the first couple yeah. of albums and all these because oh, that's people. the whole Trident scene isn't it because Ken goes that's on right. yeah. Ken goes on and does Ziggy Stardust and Exactly. Visconti, I mean, surprised Visconti. Do you mind, I just want to skip out a sequence here yeah. a bit because I'm sorry, you, you said John Lennon and I'm, and I'm not, we're not, we're not going past that. But there's, <laughs> there's a the story because when you recorded with him, there, there was a, an apocryphal story I heard for years, which is that he came and because he was just so out of practice and everything that you have basically had to get his whole sound together for him and everything. Well, not get his whole sound together because, I mean, the way yeah. great guitar players are, you hand them a guitar and they'll get something great out of it. Yeah, now, yeah. if you work with John Lennon, I mean, I basically gave him my, one of my, my old gold top. I gave him my gold top. I said, you play that, I'll play this. And because we did the Lucy in the Sky track live, and that's mm -hmm. the way we always did tracks. That was the way something else we're all missing terribly these days. But, I mean, mm -hmm. we always recorded as a band, so... I gave John, John my Les Paul and he said, oh, what do you want me to play? And I, I said, what do you mean? I said, you wrote the fucking song. Play whatever you want, you know. I don't care what you fucking play. Play whatever you want, you know. And um, it was just the best thing because he came up with that reggae uh, interlude in that song. Uh -huh. but, but we were doing... And the magical thing that about it, the whole thing was magical because we all loved John. We all but got he, on so but well. He could he could be irreverent, couldn't he? He was allowed to be irreverent. Oh, absolutely. And we all. I'm wondering if this is around the time. What year was this? It was was it 74? 74. Oh, 74. So it was. I'm just thinking because I'm I'm just thinking of, of the thing between him and Paul because when uh, when Paul did live and let die, live and let die. Yes. Which had the reggae bit in it. Well, I'm just wondering if he's going. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's quite possible. I don't know if it yeah. was really, it might have been, because the way John was, yeah. he was hilarious. Yeah. But if you remember, back then, there was a period that almost every single had a reggae breakdown. <laughs> yeah. You know, Eric, it's like, yeah. what the fuck? It, it, it became, yeah, like it's the, in, in the 90s, it was the rap. Yes. In the mid 70s, it was the reggae section. Exactly. And so, <laughs> but it still sounds good to me when I, when I hear the, the track, I go like, sounds great. And so that was great. But really, on that song, that particular song, the thing that really made us all shiver in the studio was when he sung the chorus with Elton. And as soon as you heard Elton's voice on that chorus part, we all kind of looked at each other and it was like, oh, wow. You know, and yeah. apart from the fact that he was just a lovely man and funny as hell, we had a great, great time for that whole year to end it up by playing with him on stage, having him on stage with our band. Madison was Square just, Garden. Just unbelievable. I mean, just an incredible moment all the way around and all the way from the band to the crew to the audience there was this atmosphere of what is happening. This is amazing. I'm so glad I'm here. There was that but genuine But there's an amazing thing. story, isn't there? This is an amazing story that goes on because apparently that is the night that John and Yoko reconciled. And in theory, that's where Sean was conceived. And she sent, she sent a, a flower, didn't she? An orchid or something? Yeah, that's right. Day, it was, John it was wore a gardenia, it? Yeah. I believe. Gardenia. He wore it in his lapel on the show. You can see if you see it. I mean, criminally, there's actually not much film or anything uh, uh, from that gig, which was, I, I always wonder why that was. I think, you know, f there was a period where I would think, well, think like that. You didn't think like that no, back then. Exactly. You, you know. It was like, well, there's another aspect though. It was like, oh, we're too cool. We don't do TV. We don't do this. We don't do that. Yeah. So we just won't film it, you know? Oh, yeah, okay. but it felt, it felt so rock and roll felt still like it, <clears throat> it was just what people do when they're young. And that we never imagined yeah. that 50 years later, we'd, you'd still be doing it and we'd still be honoring it. And it would become, you know, so historic. It's amazing, isn't it? It really is. And, and, uh, and I really felt that um, on this farewell tour because it felt like we're one of the last bands out there doing this, playing live mm -hmm. to people, playing live music and rocking our brains out and giving everything. That's the other thing. We've always been, you know, giving the whole thing. And I've seen a lot of bands over the years who maybe kind of get disinterested and they're just going through the motions. And, and that's maybe if that's their vibe, that's fine. But we've always been the kind of band that, all right, we've been playing these songs for quite a long time, but let's keep making them fresh. Mm -hmm. So, you know, occasionally Elton would call me up like twice a week and he'd call me up after a gig and go, what's going on? He said, this is sounding better than we've ever done it. You know, and he'd be genuinely blown away. And I would too. Wow. We'd be going, I know this is just so much fun because we're taking it, we keep raising the bar for ourselves. Yeah. Because I think that's where a lot of people stop. They forget that you've got to keep doing it for yourself as much as the, the people and making it great. Well, yeah, but but because but, I was going to say kind of the opposite to that. Obviously, you've got to do it for yourself. But because the one thing at that Manchester show, that one thing that was so clear was Elton's absolutely genuine love and gratitude to his audience absolutely you know, that's he always been, and he was talking about all the old clubs in manchester the twisted wheel and yeah everything. And, <laughs> and and it was like the the support of that city had all had meant so much to him. and and he just wants to you know and all of you you just want to give it to those people you know yeah i think it's important so. isn't it to acknowledge your peers and whatever else is going on and and the people of course they're the ones who make it all work Mm -hmm. uh, they allow us to do it. Uh, people do feel that, and I think it's important to express it, definitely. And, and that's always been a big thing with us, you know, and especially on that last tour. Uh, there was a lot of gratitude pouring from the stage, yeah. and people felt it. I just want to yeah. dip back into your formative years, David. Where did you, you know, was music in your family? How did it all, you grew up in Scotland, right? Edinburgh, where yeah. were you? Edinburgh, Edinburgh in Scotland. And the first thing that I heard, I have two big sisters. They're wonderful. And so they're 12, 10 and 12 years older than me, respectively. But so when I was five, I was here and they had a little dance set or something, a little record player. But he played the old 78s, obviously, at that time. And the mm -hmm. first thing that I really heard was, was Jailhouse Rock. Mm -hmm. Their records, you know, so I'd be five, they'd be 15, 16. Ah, and I heard Jailhouse Rock 
and I heard all shook up. I heard Heartbreak Hotel. I heard Buddy Holly, oh boy, and that kind of thing. And Little Richard. And I went, what is this? Because I was also hearing on the radio, you'd hear Frank Sinatra and other things. And I go, yeah, that's great. I, I know what that is. But it wasn't until I heard the rock and roll where I went, oh, you know, that's something that I want to do. I, I understand that. Um, ironically, I met, you know, I worked with Little Richard a couple of times way down the line and we had the best time. What a great, what an amazing wow. person really? and funny, funny Well, guy. obviously, who better than you? I mean, you've got more game working with flamboyant piano players <laughs> than anyone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so true. But he did something unbelievable. I've got to slip this in so you'll get, you'll like this one. Um, we were doing a, a rehearsal for a show that we were doing in LA years ago. And um, little Richard was doing um, Tutti Frutti, Great Balls of Fire, and Lucille, right? So I'm getting to play that behind him with our band at that time. We played, you know, we were backing up all the acts who were on. It was a huge bill with George Michael and Sheryl Crow and Elton and all these different, uh, Julie Andrews, it was unbelievable. Cool. So anyway, little Richard's in <laughs> rehearsal, right? We're in rehearsal. And we played Lucille and we finished it. And he turned around to me and he said, where are you from? <laughs> and I said, I'm from Scotland. He said, shit, honey, you must be from the black part of Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> I just fucking, I lost it. I lost it completely. And I actually, uh, I, I titled a track on my, uh, the album with my family, an, an instrumental. I had to title it Black Scotland. It's called that Brilliant. because of Brilliant. because of Richard. Um, but yeah. Awesome, but how did you awesome how did you get into playing guitar? Let's just have that story. So it was violin first. Oh uh, yeah, it? I did. I played uh, viola at school from seven years old, and that was another one whereby you know it was an accident. Uh, I remember somebody coming around our classroom and saying. Does somebody want to play, learn the, the violin? We're going to be starting classes. And my hand went like that. And I'm kind of looking at my arm going, why did I put my hand up? I, I, no clue. Wow. So, but it, what it was. It, but it, if you it, hadn't have done that, could you imagine? I know. Yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah. So what it did was it taught me intonation. It taught me fingering. It taught me all kinds of stuff about music. Um, so within a few years, I was, instead of doing this, I was playing it down here, you know. And finally, uh, <laughs> one of my sisters got me a guitar, a little, an old acoustic, when I was, I think, 11. And that's when I started mm. learning everything I could. You know, in those days, you listened to the radio. That was it. That was what you had. So, you know, I'd be sitting by the radio, listen, waiting for, you know, Radio Luxembourg or whatever, waiting for a Beatles song to come on or a Stone song so I could learn the part really quickly. And... Um, and that's how you learned back then. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, it went very quickly from then. Maybe the next year, I, my dad was kind enough to get me an electric guitar and a tiny little amp. It was the worst guitar on the... But it was brilliant when I think back. It was called a Broadway. And um, it was 12 pounds, I think. Got this guitar. And I just kept, you know, advancing. And by the time I was 13... I was playing in a local rock band where all the other guys were in their 20s and I'm 13. So it always was like that. I was like the kid all the time. Mm. Um, but I was the kid who was going, have you heard that Beatles song? We should do that. Or we should do this. Or, you know. So my, I think my infectious excitement for music is another thing that's really helped me over the years because I, I was never afraid to say, well... Maybe it should be like this or like that. And that's always helped me through doing session work with other people. It's given me, um, it's given me the confidence to say, well, I really think that we should do that. Or, you know, what about this? I'm not, not to try and offend somebody or saying I know better. But in some cases I've found, in many cases I've found that I tend to have a really good perception of what it might be, what would be a good place to start. And, and I've, I've just had a lot of fun doing that. So the whole folk thing really followed when I, I found another idol to copy, um, which was Barney McKenna from the Dubliners. Barney was the banjo player oh. in the Dubliners. And if you hear some of his early banjo stuff, you know, when I heard it, 
I, I, I thought I was, I thought, I thought that was it. This is what I want to do. So I had to go and buy a banjo. I'd find up, go to all the pawn shops and find a... That's brilliant, because that, this isn't something we've heard from a lot of guitar heroes we've had on the show, <laughs> no. if we're honest. <laughs> And no one's I'm ever sure. sma no one's ever smashed a banjo apart from maybe someone in the audience who'd had enough. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it 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 really um, it's the kind of music. If you listen to the old Dubliner stuff and the Chieftains yeah. and all that, I, I got suddenly romanced by traditional Irish and Scottish music. So I learned to play banjo like Barney McKenna. I learned to play mandolin like Dave Swarbrick. I learned to do play guitar like John Martin and the Incredible String Band. And I put all that together. And then, of course, I had to get a sitar when I heard, you know, the Beatles stuff. And of all the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. And the thing was, there's a, there's a wonderful, probably the, the, the grandfather nowadays, I hope he doesn't mind if I call him that, uh, of folk music is uh, Archie Fisher. Yeah, you may have heard of Archie. Uh, just an amazing singer guitar player I went to his apartment in in Fife years ago he had got invited to his apartment it was like it was like going into a temple Archie was like you know the man he was the guy and he had a he was sitting cross-legged on a rug with incense burning playing the sitar and I walked in I went oh god I gotta do that so that was my next influence I, I gotta get a sitar <laughs> Did you so play I, sitar I, on Tiny Dancer? No, have I got that wrong? No, no. Um, Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn. Holiday, yeah. That's the one with, but you, you know, don't... with sitar on it. <clears throat> yeah, but you oh, played... Oh, yeah, the... I played acoustic on Tiny Dancer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but I can, I can... There's a lot of snobbery in folk music, isn't there? And, and, and I... But you... you yeah. Was there a moment when you thought, I'm going to leap into rock and roll here? Or did Elton not appear rock and roll to you? Because I think you mentioned about once about you were quite surprised when you suddenly found yourself playing live and it was a lot more glamorous than you imagined. Absolutely. Um, nobody, nobody really warned me or gave me any idea what it was going to be like because having been a folky for, for several years and a session guy and not really a performer, well, not at all a performer on a rock and roll stage. I mean, if you saw Magna Carta, it was three guys sitting on stools and, and singing these beautiful songs and, and playing different instruments, fine. But to get on a stage and suddenly project rock and roll, I had no clue. And nobody told me. Dean, Nigel, or Elton never said a word. You know, I had no idea he was going to start doing, you know, handsprings off his, <laughs> on the piano and shit like that. And I'm going, okay, what are we going to do? So at that point, I think, was when I started thinking, okay, well, if I'm going to be a rock star, I better start drinking a lot more. I better start smoking a lot more hash. I better, you know, do this and I better do that and wear stupid clothes. So granny takes yeah, a trip. If that's what it takes. That's it. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's really what happened. And I decided to, okay, I'm going to immerse myself in this. You scene. had the hair. You had the hair. You had Mick, Mick yeah. Ronson's hair and all of that. You know, yeah, yeah. You, cause the yeah. Did you have to throw out, you had to throw out all your cable knit sweaters? Yeah. <laughs> all went. All of that went. The, all the fair isle stuff. All of that went. Yeah. I, I have a clear yeah. memory of walking into our tiny little kitchen. My mum was washing up and I said, mum, can I have one ninety nine? I've got to buy Don't Shoot Me. Uh. And... Um, and and that was a glam rock album in many ways, wasn't it? Because that competition for Elton, what Elton's always been good at is 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 embracing whatever's going on in the in the ether. And yes. you, you you made an album that was tasteful, but at the same time had the sort of elements of glam about it. I I, I really loved that album. Um, like you say, the elements were kind of like we, we were almost like. Um, documenting what was going on in music at that point. It was suddenly like, okay, if we're the guys, we've had this kind of stuff, we're going to start doing that. And, and the, some of the songs on that album, like, for example, Teenage Idol, that was all about, mm -hmm. that was all about Mark, you know, because Mark was, was a mate it? back right. then and it was really an ode to him, you know, and Crocodile Rock, which I've got to tell you, that record to this day, I love the record. You know, in some ways... People go, oh, fucking hell, not that again. But when you listen to the actual track, it's a great, there's some great stuff. And the playing on it is so great. Elton singing, his harmonies. I mean, he sounds like, he sounds like Bobby V or the Everly Brothers on that track. But nobody got it. Although it was a massive hit, 
in America. It was the, well, no one had really, except for maybe um, McCartney with Oh Darling. No, no one had learned how to pastiche rock and roll yet. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean, it's, and, yeah. and a lot of people really thought, ah, oh, here we go, another lot. They've sold out again. They didn't get the fact that it was our little ode to rock well, and roll because you I, know it was great. But I loved the whole album. But but the thing went, that was in the air, Davy, at the time was American Graffiti, right? So that American yes, Graffiti right, had come out, yeah. and the everyone timing was, was suddenly timing was really good, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the album cover also, can we just, Yeah. But it's also another reason why you, I mean, it's very relevant you talking about documenting the times, is how fast you move through Because Elton was locked into this ludicrous deal where you had to make an album every six months. And we were doing I mean, it. Just the sheer amount. Yeah, you were. You were yeah. absolutely yeah. doing it. Yeah, it was, it was album. an incredible amount of quality material oh. to be putting out. Well, that's all we did. It was album, tour, album, tour, separate single, album, tour, you know, separate single again. That's another thing. Quite a few of the singles that we released, uh, especially in the UK, went on the album. You know, they were like Philadelphia Freedom wasn't on an album back then. And Step Into Christmas, that Christmas song, which again, if you listen to that track, that's a smoking little track. You know, it's become one of those underground things that people say, oh, please play that. And Elton will go, no bloody way, I'm not playing that. But it's a great little track. But we did a lot of separate things at that point that weren't on albums. And that was another thing. We were trying to give back, even then. We were trying to give like, back. Like, for instance, having to do a song for a film, which I really, really want to talk about. Oh, yeah. Because I'll tell you what, right? What's so funny is that... Because that part, and we'll get to the song in a second, because that part is actually played on a bass. But what you play on the guitar, on Pinball Wizard, is A, how we always think of Pete Townsend, and that's what everyone heard in their head who ever heard that song. Which is John, yeah. Because you're talking version. about John they Entwistle's. that guitar that you played. John Entwistle did Elton's the Yagadang version. bit, didn't he, on that? Yeah, no, he did the da dang da dang Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but everyone in their head has that down as towns again. Great. I know and you did it. I, you did it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you played it with you a proper have... big fat Les Paul sound. It was. You really, played it I was tonight. So happy when I heard that. You did it, Ron. You <laughs> you played it tonight. But yeah. it's true. I it was because when we did that, obviously Pete was there and oh. uh, Keith was in the control. What was that room. like? Oh. What was it like having? Oh. I mean, do, do... amazing. But again, I think that shows what we were doing at the time. We were a particular kind of band. All we did was we were playing, writing, touring, album, the whole thing, as I said. So when it came to the thing of, Elton said to me, oh, we've been asked to do the, do a track on Tommy. And I'm going, oh, what track? And he said, Pinball Wizard. I was like, okay, hands <laughs> down. I mean, hello, Can't, all right, thanks. So my immediate idea was, I'm going to have an open tuning guitar. I'm going to tune it to G. And we'll do it in C, but so I can go. Because Pete, yeah, Pete's wasn't exactly. Pete's wasn't, so, Pete, yeah, yeah. And Pete's we wasn't open tuned, right? Well, we did it recently. At, what Pete's, Pete's at wasn't open tuned? It was something. Um, no, but Pete doesn't play that part. No, so Pete doesn't play sorry, it at all. Sorry, it's just you. bass. It's a single note. It's all acoustic it's guitar. It's only a single note on the it's original. Acoustic guitar. Pete's playing yeah, on that track. It's all acoustic. Yeah, and it's brilliant. I mean. So we took the background vocal parts that Pete played on the beginning of the guitar. We used that as the intro. Um, but he loved the fact that we were giving it our take on it, that I was playing. Oh, and also, he yeah, because also, I'm sorry, because at the end, rather than going into that, the, 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 I always thought it was a bit weird, but the, the, the Who's version sort of drifts off. You go into this kind of, it's like Bowie's version of Can't Explain, <laughs> where you go into like the most archetypal who riff, yeah. but with proper boots as big as Elton wears in the Slow film down. Yeah. on. Well, <laughs> they, they loved that. And that was, that was something that just happened on the spur of the moment. Because we'd right. never worked out before we got to the studio. We hadn't worked out a thing about what we were going to do. That was the way that our band always has worked. Uh, you know, we'd get there, plug in, all right, bang, let's do it. And I, I knew in my head what I was going to do. And everybody else kind of did. Like Dee's part was based on, obviously, what John Entwistle played. Mm -mm. God bless him, another one. Yeah, and yeah. Um, that was what we went for, was that who thing. But uh, as you were saying about what I played, wasn't ever Pete's part, but he loved no. it. But the same goes for Elton's piano part. You never heard... 
you heard right it was all his chordal thing but we made it ours and I think that's what made our band so important if we were doing something else same with Lucy in the Sky we'd make it our version you know not just another version of that song but what Guy was talking about and the quality and the depth you know you're making pop music I mean there seems to be there seems you know there's pop music now and then there's serious music. You were making something that was both, you know, the depth yeah. in the lyrics and the depth in the musicianship and the depth in, 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 in Elton's vocals and, and, you know, what he was singing about. That's a given, right? That I'm just saying that because it's true. What, what I want to know are two things is how fast were you sitting there when, when Elton would get a sheet of lyrics in front of him and go, Right. What's the scansion on this? How do I how do I make this work? And and how did it work? And and how quickly could he sing those vocals and put them down? Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't believe how fast the whole process was. It was ridiculous. I mean, right from the beginning, uh, literally, he would sit down. Let's say the Chateau, for example, where we first came together as a band. He would come down. He'd be first there. He'd be sitting at his piano. I would come down, get some coffee, get a bit of baguette and go over to him. And I remember vividly, for example, when he, when he started writing Honky Cat. I mean, he, lit, he started doing this funky piano stuff and oh, and I've always been amazed and I love that style of his thing. And in, within 15 minutes, he'd have the song. And during that time, I'd be listening and I'd go, well, a banjo would be good on that. Immediately, D would sit down and he would sit in and you get to the chorus get back, honk, cat, and D would be bum, bum, gong, 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 and Nigel would be right there with the same sensibility. So mm. when people talk about magic being mm -hmm. created in the studio, that's really what this was. And the same with, applied with every single song that we did. I mean, literally, we stopped we stopped uh, practicing stuff in the breakfast room at the chateau because it was too, it was too quick. We'd have we'd have three songs immediately. We'd have to move all the the gear over to the studio, so we just stayed in the studio the whole time. Elton would get a, a, a lyric from Bernie, and you, and you never never got to have breakfast either. I <laughs> tell you. Well, we've always been a band that would start very workmanlike. You know, we would always start working early, like. 11 a.m. No matter how late we all stayed up. But I mean, we'd always start about 10.30 or 11 recording, playing, and then work till about 7 o'clock at night and then all have dinner together. So it was always that kind of family thing. But going back to the, the time things took, um, it always happened that way, all the way into all the records. But for example, when we did, um, I guess that's why they call it the blues, which I'm very happy to say that I'm a co-writer on that. Yes. Elton yeah. Elton asked me in Montserrat, he said, I want to write this song. And I'd seen the lyric. It's on a very rare occasion. Uh, Bernie had showed me the lyric because we'd flown together from LA to Montserrat. And we, we were getting a bit out of it on the plane and there was a delay and stuff. And I said, Bernie, give us a look, you know, can I have a look at, give me, give us a butcher's. And then he kind of went, no, I never, I never show anybody. But after about six Bloody Marys each and finally getting to Miami, you know, four hours late, he said, oh, all right. And he showed me some of the rights. I mean, I'm a huge bear. You immediately went, banjo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a massive Bernie fan. Bernie oh, Toppin's work. Yeah. And as Gary was talking about at the beginning of, the, of his wind up here, of that question, uh, Bernie's stuff is such a monstrously huge part of this whole thing, obviously, because mm -hmm. when you get a lyric to start off with, that's what you start with. And very, very rarely did it happen the other way where Elton would have an idea and he'd ask Bernie to write a lyric. It only happened a couple of times. But um, with, with blues, I'd seen the lyric and I knew how beautiful it was. So when Elton said to me in the studio, I really want to write this just with guitar. What do you think? And I'm like, yeah. So we sat down, the two of us opposite each other, me with an acoustic, him just sitting there with the lyric. And we wrote it in 15 minutes. And Bernie's work, and I think Elton would wholeheartedly agree with this, there's something about it that makes you think of a certain image, all this imagery comes to mind. 
Uh, and it's not. Well, just... it's very cinematic. I mean, yeah. even, 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 even with very overt references. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. It's not just you know, yeah. I love you, baby. You are. It's, no. it's really more like you know, a story and a picture. You'd, like and you'd go and inside cinematic. and outside, wouldn't you? One minute you'd be next to them in the bed, as it were, and then you'd be outside, we're looking at the weather, you know. And did, that's did, it. Did... That's it. I mean, God bless that whole thing. And again. I put it down to that magic that I was talking about. Um, I don't think anything in music happens without magic. I really don't think it does Uh, because. But I love that, like, like the thing that that you know that Elton and Bernie have never ever been in the same room when it happened, and so and I can see how that probably happened for a bit. Then it probably became a superstition, didn't it? (laughs) That they can never be in the same room. Because they probably could. Yeah. But are they are they never, Davey? Are they, was he never there? No, they've never been in the same room, right? Well, I think there's this actually has been the odd occasion. Uh, I'm trying to think when that oh, might be, oh, but no, I don't. You killed I, everything, no, but I Davey. don't. I, no, you're right. You're right, guy. But I think there might have been the odd occasion later on in, in the thing when they had to do right. different projects, when maybe something would happen where, because um, it went on from being the rock and roll thing and the albums to plays, to musicals, to movies, to different things. Right. So I think occasionally Elton's so respectful of Bernie's stuff. Um, and you're right, it's very rare that they'd be in the same room. But Elton would always call Bernie if there was something he wasn't unsure about. It might even be if there was an and in the in the line that he wanted to put in. He would call Bernie up in LA and say, I wanted to change that to... Th- is that okay? And Bernie goes, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. Let's talk about Yellow Brick Road. I mean, just, uh, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. you know, we're talking. That, that's the one for, I've got to say, that's the one for yeah, me, yeah. Davey. That, yeah. you you know, that was one of the first albums. Because had, there's was, there's nothing wasted on that, you know. But, yeah, it's not but, an ounce of Did fat. you go in yeah. knowing it was a double album? Probably the most I mean, fun. did that happen? Probably the most fun we've ever had in the studio together. It was so much fun doing that record. Because at that point, if you, we were kind of given license to do whatever we wanted. It was already quite obvious to us that we were up there, we were the thing, you know. So it wasn't going to our heads. It just meant we're going to have a great time with this. We're going to record as much as we want and do whatever, you know. The idea actually had been to record a double album before we even went to France for that record. I think the original working title was something like um, Silent silent pictures, talking movies, something like that. But the idea was a very cinematic deal, given Bernie's penchant for writing such incredible well, stories. The songs are full of it. So yeah, we had all these it, great stories and all these characters in different mm-hmm. colors. And Danny Bailey. Marlon it was a, co- it was Monroe, a concept Danny album, yeah. uh, the yeah. silver screen. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just something that, this is going to be so much fun. And, and, and we just loved it. And everything about doing all the backgrounds, you know, it was something that we'd become very good at doing. So like harmony, doing all those background vocals for that part. And just, it was almost like the pinnacle of all these things that we had learned together, to do together. Uh, we were kind of, okay, here's the whole picture. And it really was like that. It was such a fun, I always think of it as being a yellow record because of the, there's this kind of sunlight around the whole mm. thing. It's mm. kind of, it, you know, the album cover reflected it perfectly, I thought the whole thing, that mm-hmm. cover, and um, yeah, very special for us, and very special for, I think, all the people who had bought the record and held it in their hands as a real piece well, of art. There's you know. an interesting thing, because, you know, this was an album about a bygone era when, when the the medium was, was the silver screen, as it were, and there's a sense when you went out, it was a full circle, here was, here, here was Elton, really in an age where rock and roll, the golden age, is, is almost the bygone era. Yeah, I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. Because, I mean, here's the other thing, I think. Uh, Elton, as far as I'm concerned, is a really true, you know, rock and roll icon. Um, I thought it right from the beginning because of my own appreciation of people like the Beatles, uh, <coughs> the Stones, Elvis, the Kinks, people that we heard, but also people like Joni Mitchell um, or the Incredible String Band. And when I found out when I first met Elton and we'd talk about what we liked, he'd be like, oh, shit, I love Wee Time and the Big Huge. And I, I was like going, wow, this guy knows who they are and he knows who Joni is and this kind of thing. And, and um, he appreciates the whole, yeah. the whole gamut. He appreciates yeah. 
you know, classical yeah. music. He played me some stuff early on. Um, that again, I was kind of amazed that he was aware of, you know, really ob obscure. Like he played me Albinoni. Um, it was an adagio. Uh, I actually uh -oh. did a, a recording of it back in the 80s, just playing with Nicky Hopkins playing piano and a oh, guy wow. from Steppenwolf playing organ. So I, <laughs> that's a, playing that's stuff that changed my my mind a couple of times, you know. So yeah. I think that's the reason that we always got on because we've always been so excited about different people in our industry. And although we loved what we were doing, we never took it. How do I put this? We never took it that seriously. We loved what was happening. But it was like, okay, we're doing this and that's great. But have you heard this? Can I tell one little story about the one time I recorded with Elton? Do. Which was, I played on, uh, just once, or trust me, on the El Dorado. But the day I went into the studio, it was with Pat Leonard. Right. My dear friend was producing. Right. That side. And, but the day I went in was the day after the Brits, when Craig David had been nominated for every single <laughs> award, pretty much, and hadn't won a single one. And Elton was livid. He was absolutely furious on Craig David's behalf, <laughs> which was really brilliant and really honourable mm. of him, but really awful for me. <laughs> <laughs> A brilliant story. <laughs> um, oh, I love that. Sat well, again, <laughs> this shows the way yeah. he was about championing people yeah. and the way Saturday he night genuinely offended. Davy, Saturday night's all right for fighting. I mean, you know, the guitar part in that, I grew up loving that as, as a young guitarist. Oh, thanks, man. I had the privilege. He played on it with I used me to one run night, a couple of nights. I, he remembers. I played on it a couple of nights in Dublin. Yeah. I think maybe a couple of nights at Wembley Arena. That's right. What a thrill that was. But that was such a great guitar part. I mean, now you talk oh. about writing and Elton and there's a... Was it, you're not co-writing credit on that. It's such a big part of it. I mean... How did that yeah. track come together? Well, ironically, we had we'd gone down to Jamaica to record the the um, kind of the follow up to "Don't Shoot Me," I guess, and all everything's happening, and we thought let's have a change. We'll try Jamaica, where you know the whalers and all that. Oh, it'd be great. We'll go down there. So we went down to Kingston, and we went into the studio. Gus and Ken went into the studio, and the guy who ran the studio was called Carlton and he was a great guy and um, we knew we were in trouble when <laughs> Gus walked into the main recording studio and there was no gear in there right. and <laughs> Gus said soon Gus come said, soon come yeah, yeah, yeah Gus said you know where's all where's all the equipment you know we're going to start in a couple of days and and the guy shouted out Carlton get the microphone and that was it that was it, you know. <laughs> that, was, we, that was all they, they had. They had to order gear from Miami, and that was another few days. So we ended up getting hammered for a week, you know, on the local ganja and having fun and just, just laughing the whole time. So when we actually got started, we realized it wasn't going to be suitable. And we, I think we, record, we did record a track uh, of Saturday Night, and it really, Elton has described it in the past as sounding like a swarm of angry bees because it was so thin. The sound was so weedy and thin. <laughs> but here's the cool part. When we decided, okay, that's it. We can't do this here. Let's go back to the chateau. We got to the chateau because we knew we are on home ground, you know. So we all knew the song. But Elton said, look, I just want to do it. I don't want piano on it. Let's just do full on guitar song. Great. So it was on me to come up with the intro, the whole part, and do the whole thing. And while we were doing it, and it happened very, very quickly. I think it was like the second take. So the intro I came up with was really just out of nowhere. I think what makes it sound so cool is the fact that I layered so many guitars, you know, on the intro and then laid out during the verses, added some more parts in the chorus, some kind of Lenin-y parts. And then for the solo section, when it's just guitars, it's right in your face because I had another four guitars. And so by, by the solo section, there's like 12 guitars rocking out, you know. And um, I actually used, for those guitar aficionados, um, apart from my Les Paul, I used... Um, I was going to ask, I was going to say, that is actually, you do have to tell us that. Oh, yeah. It, it's it's uh, two Les Pauls, one, one the old gold top, uh, old 1963 
and then my three pickup custom black beauty which i use on the, the other tracks and um but amps i used um uh, ac 30s and then i used fender champs the little practice amps oh yeah i used like four of them right but we recorded it so that it, the needles were pinned and it just sounds whoa when it comes in so yeah it was so much fun and while we were doing the track elton was just dancing around the studio with a microphone come on you bastards and you know <laughs> and just d and nigel and me doing it and here's the classic after i spent maybe an hour doing all the guitar parts because it was one after another bang 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 and it sounded amazing and Elton said, that's it. And I said, look, man, you've got to put p- piano on it. And Gus said the same thing. And he's going, no, 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 I'm not going to put piano on it. And I said, look, please. So we were like pleading with him. Look, when it gets to the solo, just do one of your, one of your glissandos. And, and he did. And so when that piano comes in, it's like, yeah. that's kind yeah. of, for me, Don't give really none of your of here he comes, you know, oh, Mr. Oh, piano oh. icon. Yeah, and it, to this day, it's become the track that everybody relates to, which is well, bizarre because it wasn't a massive hit, you know. Really, I mean, such a privilege to play play on stage with you that time. But what I do remember, oh. well, I'm surprised. Your memory is amazing, by the way, amazing. But and, and I'm yeah. surprised because I went to a few of your after show parties. Mm. Oh my <laughs> god! Oh my god! Right, so those ones in Dublin. I Whoa. mean, let's just 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 you know. You parted hard, you guys, didn't you? Oh, man. And, you know, you were there that one of those. You were there several of those nights. And I remember Joe Elliott being there yeah. a couple of nights yeah. and, and yeah. those guys. And and, and we, we had drunk the hotel out in our, in Dublin, out the of Guinness. West, the Westbury. Yeah. 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 We drunk it out of Guinness. So they had to send to another hotel. That gets you a plaque, doesn't it, on the wall? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And Joe said... He said, how often do you guys do this? And we looked at each other and went, every night? And it really was like yeah. that in those days. And, you know, it, those were danger years. So thankfully, you know, a few years after that, Elton was able to, to sort himself out and, and deal with it in the most honorable and the most honest and the most direct way, as, as most of you have all heard that story. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, those times were, were, were crazy. They were dangerous. Did, did, it's only did, our stamina that, that, that allowed us to, was, to weather that whole period, you know, was there a, playing. He, he sort of, am I right to think this, that he, he split the band as part of his cleaning up process? What went, what happened? Yeah, yeah, he had to just basically... People, places and things. Yeah, exactly. He had to get away. He had to do his thing and be away. And, and um, I was... I was so happy for him that he was doing it. I was surprised, but I was so happy for him at that period because it was just so traumatic. I mean, I think the last record uh, leading up to that time when he said, I need to have a break, was uh, Sleeping With The Past, which has got some great stuff on it. Mm. And by then we were working with my dear friend, Chris Thomas, oh, yeah. uh, who produced several oh, of the great my mate, Yeah. yeah. Uh, I spoke to him just the other oh, day, did you? in fact. So, yeah, I yeah. love Chris and um, I love yeah, Chris. I can I just say, Chris, yeah. Anarchy in the UK, one of the best guitar sounds on any record. Chris Absolutely. Thomas. Absolutely. Uh, when I heard that, I was blown away. And they did that in what a day, yeah. the whole album, Mm-mm. like insane, you know. And uh, yeah, love that. I, I, I love Jonesy as well, you know. <laughs> He's a great guy. So, but, but, but yeah. you're, I mean, can I ask a personal question? Because obviously you were partying as well. Absolutely, and, and that was that was a longer process for you to let go. Of. Absolutely, I, I think you know until you realise um, properly, come to your senses that this is probably not the way to carry on if you want to live any longer. Um, and again, I was given a lot of help in that area by my dear friend Elton. You know, he was actually the first one who gave me a nudge and. We were sitting at his place one day. I'd been staying there for a few days. And we're having breakfast and having some cup of tea and toasted marmalade or something. And out of the blue, he looked up from his newspaper and he said, you know what, I think you should probably have a look at what you're doing with your drinking and everything else that you're doing. And then carried on reading. And I would, I would kind of look back and say, what? 
And I did what every person in that situation tends to do, which was, what, me? I'm fine. What about the drummer? He's much worse than me. That kind of thing, you know. And, and he went, no, I'm, I, you're my friend and I'm talking about you. And it was like a jolt, a real jolt. And um, I went back to California a few days later and really thought deeply about what he said. Obviously, when, you, when your closest friend says something like that, if you don't listen, then you really, you know, forget about it. Luckily, I did. And um, I was very fortunate to meet a lot of other friends uh, of mine who'd done the same thing. And I, and I cleaned up entirely. So it's been wonderful because it's helped my, it's helped my playing. It's helped my family, my children, my wife and I. Um, it's helped the whole thing. Mm. Everything has gotten better, you know, um, and I, I, it's, been a, yeah, it's no, a gift that I, I I've been given, um, and I accepted it wholeheartedly uh, because I think life is too fleeting, as we've seen. Too many people that we've seen due to you know, substances or whatever, just behavior in general, we've lost them. You know, we don't have mm. Kurt Cobain anymore. We don't have Amy. We don't have so many of mm. those amazing people, Tom Petty, Prince, who have gone way too soon because of some ridiculous, you know. There's also just the thing, Davey, I'd say that when I look back on a lot of times I had, is the thing of, of wanting to be present. Absolutely. When you suddenly think, there was a lot of those amazing things that happened and you could have really been there. That's right. And maybe you weren't, you know. You know? Well, you know what, I get, you mentioned my memory the other day and I do have a phenomenal memory, I'm blessed with that. Let's pray that, you know, that doesn't go... Um, but thankfully, as far as all the gigs we've done over the years, I haven't forgotten anything. I mean, I remember, I remember being out of it on stage playing certain concerts. I really do. <laughs> but, but I remember, you know, those events. I remember Elton and I being so whacked out of it. There was a concert where he tried to push his piano off stage. Now, it's difficult to push a piano off stage. Not very easy at all. This is a, what, a three-ton instrument or something. But you know what? He had so much strength given by whatever the hell he was doing with his life that he was able to raise this thing up. So he's pushing the piano off stage and the crew are at the other side pushing it back, trying to stop it going into the audience and killing several people. I mean, this kind of thing is unbelievable, but I mean... This is the kind of thing, you know, this is how stupid the behavior can become. Mm -hmm. So things like that. I'm glad I remember them because I remember them and I go, God, I'm so glad we're not there anymore. And I found that most people who've had the gift of recovery, that's the thing that they say most is, thank God we're not doing that anymore. Jesus Christ, you know, yeah. one thing is how we ever managed to survive. But thank God we don't have to deal with all that anymore. And that's true. It's it's a it's a freedom that I've been given that um, I never knew existed, and now I'm really grateful for that. I, I know exactly what you're saying, Davey, and I'm wholeheartedly with you. Glastonbury was amazing, wasn't it? That crowd. I mean, you I had you no just idea. because the no demographic clue. was so huge. I know. You know. I mean, not only was it the biggest, well, it's the biggest crowd there's ever been at that stage, isn't it? Uh, we keep hearing stuff like that. All, all I know is that mm. I I've never felt that much love coming at us at one time and then coupled with the fact of starting that whole thing with pinball wizard and be able to go on it to somebody here we go but um you know we're suddenly yeah. like all right we get to do this mm -hmm. we get to do this for these amazing people i mean we're seeing banners in the audience and we're seeing you're seeing people icons paul mccartney and, and slash and uh, you know, Dave Grohl and people who were, Rick Astley, my dear friend. Mm. I mean, Rick and I have been friends forever and both are... are That's right, you played on an album of his back in 2005, didn't you? Did I? I might have done. Yeah. Yeah, well, we've been dear friends and... and we uh, love Rick. We are. What's that about the memory? We love Rick. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll have to talk to Rick about that one. He may have put my name on the album. Not told yeah. me. Friendship, but, um, Davey Johnston. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, this, he's one of my dearest friends. And I thought he killed it at Glastonbury. His set, Absolutely. playing drums in on so many Highway ways. to Hell. In so many ways. Yeah. yeah. 
phenomenal. And and I when I see somebody <coughs> like Rick having that success today that he's having, it's like wow. And it's so well deserved. I mean, Rick mm. is brilliant. His band is brilliant. Mm. Uh, in fact, I'm coming over in November to see a couple of his gigs at the Albert Hall or whatever he's playing uh, as part of his Christmas type thing he, he does over there. Great. Oh, but can we just tell a, uh, just tell a quick story, David? Because we had him on, on, on here and he was just adorable. And in our preamble, we said, because we'd had a big run of things where prog seemed to be the recurring thing with the podcast. And we said, well, I think, well, I think we can agree that this is one po- you know, this is one episode where we're not going to be hearing anything about prog rock. He comes on first thing he says, first gig I saw, Camel. <laughs> <laughs> Man, he, well, he's such a great drummer. You know, he's totally that's it, rock and roll. You know, he gets it, mm-hmm. and I think that's why he's become such a close friend of the Foo Fighters because I mean, he's been a massive fan of them anyway, and Dave Grohl always loved Rick, so. When they actually met up and and they realized that they wanted to do a version of Never Gonna Give You Up the way they play it and Rick was going to sing it, that kind of thing happening. I love those kind of things. You know, the, oh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. where those hybrid things happen. You think, what a weird thing to... But it makes sense to me that Rick should be such a close friend of those guys because he's a monster. Mm-hmm. He's a, a genuine monster of rock, you know. And uh, I put oh. him up there with everybody. He's, he's, the, he's the greatest. What, what do you, and what the do you, sweetest man. But do you think Elton, he's going to do one-off shows, surely, at some point? Because his voice was so good. He's, he's, it's not like he's mm-hmm. retiring because his voice has, has, go, has gone. Uh, his voice is amazing, isn't it? I mean, yeah, he's just got... Amazing. He's, he's suddenly now got this giant, big, full-bodied thing that's going yeah. on, you know. And, yeah, uh, Paul Robeson it's awesome. kind of... No, yeah. he's always got that. I mean, he's just one of the most amazing singers uh, to this day that... that you know, he's up there with anybody. Always will be, as far as I'm concerned. The greatest, you know. Thank you, Davy. Oh, my God. You know what? I could... And I just want to say Sorry. one thing, because you did have this incredibly... Because, you know, there's all the work you did with other people. Steve, Steve Alice Steve, Cooper? Yeah, um, hundreds of people. Alice Cooper. And I was desperately hoping that... All the stuff in the 80s, I was desperately hoping there'd be something somewhere that we played on together. And we never played on the same song, but you and I have played on one album together. Okay. Which is A Spanner in the Works by Rod Stewart. We're both on that. Brilliant. Brilliant. Wow. I love nice. that. Oh, fantastic guy. Well, I tell you what, I've played with you on record. I've played with Gary a couple of times live, and I love both yeah. you guys. And, and um, I love what you guys are doing. And I'm really looking forward to finding out about this Pink Floyd stuff you're doing. Ah, oh, as I call yeah, you secrets. guys now, the Rock on Tour. Saw that, <laughs> saw that on our Instagram. That was so oh, nice. Awesome. Thank I can't you. wait. Because, you know, I mean, those guys, I mean, I've always loved Pink Floyd stuff. I love David. I love his playing. Uh, who doesn't? You know, what they've given to music. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. It's Davey, so let's try and meet up when we're in the same town together. Absolutely. I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys again in the flesh. And I'll be, I'll be over, this, as I said, yeah. in, in uh, the winter, early winter, November. I'm getting some, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting some honour from the Scottish Music Awards in early November so I'm going to come over a week early see right. Rick and a few of my mates in London so I'll be around and then I'll be around after that for a week in London and just going to get together with some mates so hopefully I can see you guys would love to All see right. would love to see you this has been just a joy from beginning to end an absolute joy thanks so much for having me on guys it's brilliant I'm so I'm really I'm really honoured thank, thank you thank you so much all the best sir Oh, I mean, I love that. That was one of my favourites. I can't help it. One of my absolute favourites. Could have, could have just gone on and on and on. I, I mean, if you look at, we actually talked about very. Few I know. Albums. You know, I'm always a slightly wary of the time, and I know people. We'll have to get him back on, but you know, there's that thing. If I know, as a as a podcast listener, if I look down, I see two hours for a podcast. I'm, I'm always a, I'm, I'm sort of like not sure. But there's also the thing, Gary. Like, I have a real problem with with biopics or biopics. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Which is the whole when there's the whole career. The good ones are always when someone like the Laurel and Hardy one. You pick an event in someone's life and you make a film about that, and that tells you that's much better way of telling their story because you have time to get into the character. And I think when we do that, that's better for our listeners. And they they don't need to have the whole chronological beginning to end. They need the essence of who that. I mean, we miss Caribou and the you know and all of you know. I mean. 
there, there, there's yeah, a lot. Yeah. There's a lot there, and we 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 get. So, I mean, a lot. Like I said, you know, this guy. I mean, there's no one else we've had on who was making two albums a year all the way through the 70s. Yeah, the, pro, the product is is incredible. Yeah. Um, but what a nice man! What a nice man! I really, I absolutely love it. You know what I've got to do now? My wife has gone up to Edinburgh to take my our boy back to uni, and I've got. I can hear the dog going crazy already. I don't know if you picked up on that, but I've got my 11-year-old and 14-year-old who are waiting to be fed. <laughs> oh, okay. no. So we'll be back next week with a, with another rock hero of some sort or another, I'm sure. Indeed. So thank you to Ian, our producer, and for all of you for listening, and uh, it's good night from me. Good night from him. 